dentistry, um, you know, is one of the greatest professions in the world. And then it allows you to, to instead of pull this surrender card, this ethic card, like you're talking about, Craig, it allows you to go with the freedom of the direction of that you want your life. So if you want more time in your life, you can optimize your practice from that, right? Get more efficient, go down to three days a week, go down to two days a week, whatever, or pull out completely. But but it gives you the freedom of direction to do that. If you want to optimize for money and scale, you can do that as well. If you want to optimize your practice for impact, meaning meaning the impact of, of either your team or the community, awesome. If you want to optimize your profit practice for profits only to then put a tremendous amount in, into a philanthropical purpose with, you know, that is amazing too. Or if you're like Craig and you just love relationships, you love being around people, you love building an ecosystem that suits you in a relationship-based practice. So it's all these tributaries of things you can do. It's not the not the direction that dental school told you to be. It can be whatever you want. Well, Peter, it's you and me here. And uh, we're, we're actually doing a special preview of our lecture um, for the audience that we're going to be doing um, on Thursday for the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. Mm -hmm. So, Figured what, what better way to then to do a dry run instead of doing a dry run that's not recorded? We're going to present, and this will launch probably around the same time we're doing it. So it, I guess it happens. There's no such thing as a dry run. This is good. This is a. This is a. We we know this material, so I'm excited to present it. By the yeah, way, yeah. um, yeah, by dry, the way, dry can mean not as good. Right. Yeah, no, I know. So uh, that makes people want to be like, nah, I'll just get to the final one. <laughs> anyway, I want to just uh, do a sidebar that it's been so cool. We've been getting so many people reaching out, commenting and, and speaking to us and directly communicating with us about this narrative that Peter and I are really uh, passionate about on the never sell. So it started from that podcast and there's such a strong narrative that's in our industry right now that, you know, you get Dennis, the CEO or exit the op or sell and the FOMO that surrounds um, selling. And it's really cool that there's a lot of people out there that are resonating with that, the, the, the narrative that we're trying to put in there, just as, which is build a business that you really love and create a life that you love. And then there's, you don't ever have to sell or you, you can just build something that you don't want to exit from. Yeah, it, it, I, I gotta say, it actually has been, I've been caught, in off, caught off guard a little bit by the amount of people being empowered and encouraged and thank you because and and you know honestly it's a very contrarian view right now um as we know we talk about it and we had that discussion i actually thought greg i was like you know i know we've talked about it on a very topical level um in terms of the ramifications and the consequences selling buying not selling buying but i kind of want to go through i, I kind of want to double down on this a little bit uh, because i think it's yeah, healthy for, for anyone trying to audit and and so right like we are in no position to tell you what to do with your life Full stop. Okay. But that being said, in order to make a, a decision that you can have no regrets on, you need all the information and, and various points of view. From, um, and so what I was thinking to do was actually take it and and do kind of almost like a whiteboard session and really get, get mathematical with it, right? Um, not yeah. to mention the freedom and the things like that, but actually take the math and show show things where you always stop me when I start talking about preferred shares and common stock and holdbacks and, and clawbacks. No, but it's a great exercise to show but the tax implications. Show, mm -hmm. There's so tax much. Implications, finding yield outside of once you finally get a check, right? Um, things like that. And 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 then and then also Craig, the consequences of now becoming potentially a W2. Right. Right. But also right. then speaking about like, okay, yes, if there is a recap on, if you do a thing, you know, the, the, I have to put some positive spin in there too. If yeah, make that it real, you don't want to just, yeah, you totally. can build the number, you can build the algorithm to show support an argument to sell or not sell. But, but I, I want to be fair and balanced, right? Yeah. I want to be, the, I want to be the, the, the metaphorical Fox news on this, but, and go a little deeper. I know we had a panel with the four of us kind of talking, yeah, right? But it needs about more this, context. And that's, that prompted it. But, but I think it'd be cool to actually get, get mathematical and and real real uh examples of the um and even maybe show some yeah anyway one, so one more thing i want to add to that too peter is what i what i see especially like looking at people's profiles and stuff like that people that have high detail perfectionistic mm -hmm. people just can't see their way through it they build themselves into a business and i was that guy and i think you were that guy i mean we can speak to this very intimately 
you were at the point where you're like, I can't do this. I, I, I just can't handle it anymore. Mm -hmm. And we were good friends at that moment. We kind of walked each other through like your thing. And then you walked it through with me, but you get to a point where you cannot see your way through this problem. You mm -hmm. hate your business. It consumes everything. It runs your life. So you have to pull the effort card. You just you think can't that's see the new normal, right, Greg? That's you're saying yeah. That, so, and, and then that, yeah. change from where right. that is. And, Right. And compensation drives behavior. So you have a lot of uh, people that are your advisor, your friend that can actually monetize your sale. Mm -hmm. So they are going to say things to you like take some chips off the table or, you know, live your life. You know, you don't want to live your life when you're 70 when, you know, and so that the combination of these voices and the feeling of I can't guide my way through it. That's what I think where you and I and Bulletproof come in. I want to be even more than we already are, the voice of like, let's fix your business. It's a micro correction. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. don't need to eat so many shit sandwiches. You're like, screw this. I've got to sell it. There's a series over maybe a year through a mastermind or something like that, where you can get to the point where you actually love your business. Yeah. And if you can get there and we believe you can, there's no freaking reason oh. why you'd want to sell it. Totally. Totally. Because it's not this, yeah, it's not this heavy lift anymore. It's, it's, right. you design the business to work for you versus the other way around. Right. And we just, and, we just don't know. And then everybody says the same thing. Well, you don't understand my business. You don't mm -hmm. understand this. I mean, look at mine, Peter, I've got my name, you know, in four foot tall letters on three sides of my building and I'm not there right now and it's operating. Right. So if I can replace me, Imagine right. how easy jo Dr. Jones from, last name. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> at, at Atlantic Family Dentistry, if it's Dr. Jones, he could even replace himself. So all I'm saying is if I can do it, if you can do it, um, then everybody metaphorically listening, you can do it too. And we'd 100%. love to help you do that. So if you're all on right, the, well, let's break you, into, yeah. let's break into, I just our wanted to say that because it's, so, no, it's, I good, just wanna, dude, it's yeah. been, it's been awesome. And you and I have had banter. You know, I think that's the beautiful, beautiful thing about our podcast is we share things that happen in our personal life and, and sure. are very transparent. And so that, that banter you and I have been having, you know, behind the scenes and all these text right. messages coming in, direct messages, emails coming in. And it's been, like I said, it's been overwhelming. So I think it's awesome to share. To share and by the way, if you're sorry to cut you, Peter, but if you're interested, if, if this is resonating for you, if this means something to you, please comment below. We need verification from you guys. You know, Peter and I can sit here and talk a bunch of bullshit for an hour. But if this is moving the needle, if this is valuable, please comment below, it, whether it's on YouTube or whatever, drop us a review. We want to make sure that we're, we're you had valid a good here. quote that you sent, and I thought that was good. It's kind of like when the masses, right? It was almost Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, and I don't know if maybe you can paraphrase Mark Twain. that. Okay, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it is time to reform, pause, and reflect. And I would say we, you know, the, narr the majority narrative right now is sell it, get out of the chair. Go, go to the beach forever. Yeah. Right. Like, and so, you know, um, it, and like I said, on, even on these economic podcasts, when, when, when everyone is proclaiming that we're going to have a recession that, that you have to pause and be like, when does things always work out the way everyone always thinks it's going to, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know? so, all right. Yeah. Good. Okay. So now ACD. Yes. We're excited. So we fly in tomorrow going to be in Dallas. What an opportunity. We're excited. This is I'm cool. glad even in this presentation, that you have announced that I'm riding on your coattails. Um, yeah, this is gonna be great because it, it's yeah. a rare opportunity when I actually ride. Um, oh my god, whatever <laughs> says the guy who okay, I won't even go there. Yeah. Oh, come on. So, anyway, right. let, let's start. So, um, obviously, advance the slides if you don't mind because there's a lot of the stuff yeah. that we don't need to go through. Yeah. You all know, you listen to our podcast, you know exactly who we are. So, we're um, talking about the, the creating the ultimate patient experience and building a recession proof practice. Um, and kudos and to I, the AACD, by the way, Peter, because the, you know you go to the AACD typically to learn better clinical skills. And what Peter and I always lament is that when people are challenged economically and they don't know what to do with their businesses, they run for more clinical training. And of course, it's extremely important they become a clinical master. But at a certain point, there's a law of diminishing returns from more and more and more clinical knowledge if you're not taking a steady diet of business and you know, more bulletproof stuff as well. And I'm not saying we're the only show in town, but you have to have a well-balanced CE diet. And I think the majority of dentists are consuming way too much clinical. Yeah. 
So, you know, and I would contend the, 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 the patient experience and kind of focusing on the operations is, is something that you, like you said, you alluding to, it's not, it's something that needs to be a fair and balanced diet, so to speak. And you need to be focusing on this. And I would contend that the information that, that people would hear in this presentation will do more to move the needle, right. Than than the, the advanced cosmetic, you know, bonding and size old trick or whatever it may be. Right. I don't, I'm, I'm yeah. just giving an example. Right. It's and not, by the way, you know, I know, no, sorry, Pete, I know I'm jumping all over the place today, but you know how you want to do that timeline with Randy about investor timeline, like when's it important to invest in your practice versus investing in private equity? Like you don't go in there right away. I, I think that there's an opportunity for an educational timeline. Brand new guy at a school mm -hmm. wants to become clinically masterful. Maybe it's not the real estate Great course idea. at that point. So. Great, yeah. I think that there's a there's a timeline for CE, but if you're 45, you've been practicing for 15, 20 years, and you're still doubling down like twice, three, four times a year just on only clinical, that mm -hmm. might be the reason why you hate your business because you can't grow it if that's what you want to do. Of course, if you want to be a solopreneur, totally cool. But like that's why it's important. Know what you want to do and then create that. Yeah. So our goal of this is to give information, take it home with you so you can start implementing Monday morning. And there's so many presentations that are like theory and things. And so you and I have been so frustrated by going to to events and leaving your family and spending time and money only to hear someone pontificate about what they've done and not give you any actionable things that can go home and transform, even on a micro, right? The trajectory of your organization. Sure. So, and I okay. love this diagram, by the way, because you you know you went to the you you've gone to a, a course because you want to know something, but what you know and what you know you don't know is still amongst the the knowing. So if you're going to a course and say, I just want to learn a little bit of marketing technique, you know, mm -hmm. you still know that the biggest mm -hmm. thing that moves the needle in life and the thing that's kicked my own ass and your ass the most is what you don't know that you actually don't know. You had yeah. no idea. I thought I was being an amazing leader. Everybody's crying every day. It was a shit show. And I just didn't know what I didn't know. So mm -hmm. I think it's important. And that's why um, I'm proud of the ACD. So um, yeah. So in full disclosure, I was asked to speak at the AACD. I There's no asked, admissions on this slide, just so you know. Okay. I asked uh, to have Peter join me and they granted permission, one conditional permission. <laughs> I did uh, get asked to speak at Seattle Study Club. That'll be airing in September. They denied Peter speaking. Um, uh, so uh, Peter had to just one up me, and he's going to at the real at the presentation tomorrow or, or Thursday. It's going to be founder of Bulletproof, which is his well. In, in full disclosure, your taunt was invited to speak at AACD on this slide, and a few of those you're not watching. And then on the, my side, it says invited by Craig to join him, and then I just yeah, had I did to jump that. in this little animation that says founder of Bulletproof. Yeah, because so we, we have to talk shit on stage. We just can't help ourselves. I mean, that's yeah. Even even in a okay. even in a. a uh, a formal audience so it's not even ours is it formal i don't know i don't okay know. let's you go know. forward let's all get right. to some content this is, all, yeah, this is just a pod so people people who are going to be hearing it um you know you know 1 million downloads 21 come on move forward this is this is all uncomfortable right. we have to flex so i love this slide so um for those of you who are not watching um th there was a, a large group of consultants and peter and i might be dating ourselves now <laughs> but it used to be like what are the ways to build culture and it was to bake fresh cookies and put them in your waiting room. <laughs> the Otis Spunkmeyer. And, the, and if you're young and you don't know that name, but like this was a thing. They were selling dental kits, dental baking ovens, right? To make the office smell like cookies to overcome the smell of, of former Cresol and Eugenol. And it was like, what are we doing? And then like Craig, you'd say you'd get these patients back and there'd be cookies all in their teeth. And it's like, what we are we doing? You can't do that. You know what it's like to do an occlusal when you have chocolate stuck in the grooves? <laughs> That's fucking, it's a shit show. Like you need a, we don't have a dental pressure washer to clean that first. How do you clean? What's the tool to use to clean Otis Spunkmeyer out of your occlusal grooves? What's if what's the you, tool you would go for? If you're listening, if you if you know what the Otis Spunkmeyer ovens are, you fell prey to that, like in the dental office. Uh, please comment because I want to see who's or, or take them out at least. Take them we out. are dating ourselves. Uh, yeah, I doubt that exists. But the point is, is like it was almost sold. I guess the the point of this slide, Craig, is that experience is more than something that you're going to buy and place in a refreshment center and be like, we got culture. Look at that. We got experience. Yeah. Look at this. We give cookies out. And then people yeah. check the box on patient experience when it's so much more robust than that, right? It's a, By it's, the way, are you still doing that paraffin hand wax treatment? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I might put, obviously it's not as bad as the Otis Spunkmeyer, but you know, it's, I'm going to, I'm going to put that in the Spunkmeyer um, type category. It's, Why? it's removed oh, because you're not doing it probably. 
No, no, no. I just yeah. Think it's anything like, you're doing is obviously no. That's not true. I, I give you credit all the time. Let's move on. No, no. no we were staying here for a second. What is wrong with a paraffin hand wax? People freaking love that. I don't know. It's like who who does it? What do you mean? Who's the one who administers the paraffin? Assistant, hygienist, like the team. Everyone chips in. People love that shit. They're heated. They're warm. I love it. What are you talking okay, about? It. All right. All you right. Just all don't right, like it. Right. You're throwing shade because you don't do it. No, no, no. I like. I like the. I like the heated and massaging chair thing, if possible. Uh, over that, if I had to pick one. Okay. But anyway, go ahead. What about? Why do you have to pick one? Do them all. Yeah, that's true. So this, we talk about the patient experience is everything in the Bulletproof Pathway, which those listening to this pod, you guys know we reference that a ton. But the point of this is saying that it happens all along the experience, not just in as a new patient. That's not where the new patient experience is. It happens in all phases of the life cycle of the patient. Yeah, um, I love that slide, by the way, the life cycle slide. It's yeah, it's just, and, and it's something we forget because we, we tend to focus on, like, well, the new patient experience, right? That's actually a term when it should be the existing patient experience. Yeah as well right it should just be or just the patient experience like like this slide right. says and it does um, not have to do with just the dentistry by the way and i know that's what everybody thinks too um but the experience craig i, I think that another point of this is the experience starts before the patient ever knows you before the patient's ever in your chair right the experience starts with how was your na how was your website was it a great experience on, on on getting them to convert how was it when they finally picked up the phone could they call or text could they schedule online when they got into your patient where they went in your office were they greeted by the team where it was parking and directions made readily available and easy like these are all little things right i could go over a hundred of these things that add up to the cumulative effect it's not the cookie the cookie you could probably it's actually not in. the crown it's actually not, it's the, not crown. the crown the crown plays a part of it but it's not that um, but it is, it does show how tone deaf the industry is for that. Um, you know, I was on a panel recently and, um, people were saying it was about culture and it was really uncomfortable because I can't keep my freaking mouth shut, Peter, but one of the other dentists, you're telling like, me, yeah, exactly. Um, one of the other dentists is like, you know, one of the things I do is, uh, we, we actually have a dog in the office and, um, and then they're like, what do you think of that? I'm like, like it has nothing dog. to do with culture. I'm like, like if your culture's. Dog? No, just like they brought their dog and I, I don't know. It was, it was basically, it was, but it, that wasn't even experience or a gimmick. That was about culture and how that can improve culture. Can and you imagine having a rubber like, dam yeah. on your mouth and having a dog in the room? Like just getting hair, like just floating around. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <kidding. Yeah. laughs> it's like flies in the operatory. But I, I just think it was interesting because if you're, if you're admin and your clinical team hate each other and you have a dog, then you have like shitty culture and dog crap and more responsibility. But I, I get it. It's, it's just not that, but um, I love this slide because what we're talking about here is it's constant fine tuning technology, team experience, um, the economy, the, the patient experience, the clinical knowledge. It's you can get by on, I always say like in marketing too, you can get by on one thing, but it's always a constant, tweaking and this is almost like an audio mixing board you know you, you yeah, have to like, have it all imagine the djs right when you see them up or you see like you know those old school pictures of people sitting in recording studios and there's all those levers and dials and there's there's looks like to be thousands of them on these mixing boards that someone's in studio and so like i think that the, the dental practice is somewhat similar to that not as complex um but i think there are certain things that you're always kind of sitting there like that like the dj with his head turned Wrap and sit in the records you're kind of looking and always kind of tweaking and turning it is not ever a set it and forget it because the people are going to change in your office the patients are going to change everything needs to be kind of constantly fine-tuned and yep. and that sounds craig daunting if, if you were to hear this and not know what we're talking about like i have to constantly do something constantly sounds not fun but it's little things. Once you get once you get elevation, once you get to that critical mass of things, then it's just like, all right, cool. Look, I'm gonna change this just a one degree here, one degree here, and you're fine tuning the experience, which is a differentiation between the practice down the street, the DSO down the street that cannot do this, that cannot yeah. do this. So getting better at doing it, by the way. But I okay, agree with you. you a, a healthy dose of paranoia. Um, once you've arrived, I think what what gets you there doesn't keep you there. I would, put, healthy, I would put the experience we're talking about, Craig, up against any DSO in the nation. Well, it's very easy. Experience up against anyone in the nation. Yeah, it's very easy to dominate your patient experience. Um, you can do things that others are unwilling to do. And whereas the solo, the dentist that owns his own practice or works in a practice that's privately held 
has the autonomy to do things that maybe the DSO may not allow them to be. And listen, we always talk about the ultimate patient hack. The best experience builder ever is the post-operative call. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that matter, if you really want to dominate the pre-operative call, like, hey, it's Dr. Bolden. Just excited to welcome you to the practice tomorrow. I saw you have a broken tooth. Looking forward to talking to you and helping you with that situation. Call the office if you have any questions. See you tomorrow. I mean, holy shit. Right. Imagine like so your own doctor calling you or, hey, it's been 18 months since you've had dental care. And I'm really concerned about that. You're getting proper yeah, treatment. Making sure you're good. You're good. And this is the doc. Yeah. And like this is that, the doc. make sure you're teeth cleaned. Yeah. I'd love to have you back. If you want to come back here, we did something wrong. Give us another shot. Like, holy shit. The retention recapture on a free phone call like that yeah. would yield 10 X the results of any formula, fancy, fancy software thing that you've any got. Any Google, any Yelp spend, anything. So it's crazy. Yeah. It's pa crazy. Finding patients that go inactive, pick up the phone and be like, Hey, just want to see what's going on. I'm the yeah. doctor. And they're like, what the fuck? You know, but, people, but also just, away. just doing it in a spirit of, um, I just want to make sure you're getting your dental needs taken care of. If you found an office that's suiting, uh, that's suitable for you. That's amazing. But you know what this is called, back, Craig? you know what, what this is for branded? dollars. No, no, no. You know what this has been branded? Tell me. The Randy retention method. The RRM? Mm -hmm. Remember he gave that idea. He's like, man, like in yeah. dentistry, if I just got a call, like, you know, and I was like, oh my gosh. We're actually trying yeah. to implement more of that going on as a on a provider level here. Okay. Yeah, well, there's, there's technology to do that too. So, I love this so slide. Go, this, go is, this is kind of funny because um, um, Give the I'm going to get in so much trouble. So when the ACD asked me to speak, you know, I, I, uh, I, I was speaking to somebody, very nice person, by the way. So I just feel like really shitty telling the story. But um, I said, listen, you know, it's not about you guys. And I want, if I were to have my own freedom of topic, I'd want to make it about the patient because it's really not about like, you know, when I, when I think of an AACD member, I think of their accreditation and Peter, you're, you're accredited, but it's like, they have all these, num you know, numbers and uh, you're not, I thought you are. I went through the process. I stopped it. Uh, I stopped at um, a couple of cases in, but yes, I went through accreditation. Okay. That sounds uh, good. That's, you know, okay. listen, never get the, let me let the truth get in the way of a good story. Well, Peter's just, pretty damn good. So in my okay. mind, Peter, Peter Bolton's accredited. I don't know what, but <laughs> accredited something. So anyway, they always have these titles beyond their names. And I said, listen, all you people, you know, I'm just going to cut you straight. or shoot you straight. You all have these things behind your names. I'm like who gives a crap? I don't care. It's not about me. It's about my patient. And the person writes me an email like to confirm and they literally had like 11 titles behind their name. Like, oh God, I felt so shitty. So uh, this slide for those that are not looking, <laughs> I just made it up. It's like, it says Craig Bamp, Bamp, Dilf, Pimp. Bamp, Dilf, and Pimp, B-I-M-P. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's just like, it's like, all our ass, bat, badass, coach, yeah. husband, father, father of the year, cowboy. <laughs> Part-time cowboy, pretty much all around badass mother. But yeah, anyway, listen, let's not make it about ourselves. And Peter, advance the slide, because that's really like the hero and story brand marketing idea. So story brand marketing, fantastic. Uh, can you advance? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to do this in the in the presentation because you're obviously dropping the fucking ball here. So anyway, it's like the story brand marketing is, is uh, don't make yourself the hero. We're the guide. We're the one that the patient is the hero. And I think that a lot of clinical organizations, it, it can feel like it's making the dentist the hero um, because like, hey, I went to Panky, I went to Koi, so I went here. And these are all wonderful uh, organizations, wonderful organizations. But at the end of the day, they are in service to your patient who is the hero. Everything you do is in service to the patient. Um, calling that patient ahead of time or after is always in service of that. I'll let you take this because you love this one. I do love, I love it. it too. Just, it kind of goes with the, the direction. It goes with what we talking. said in the beginning. Right, right. And so, you know, I contend that dentistry, um, you know, is one of the greatest professions in the world. And that it allows you to to instead of pull this surrender card, this ethic card, like you're talking about, Craig, it allows you to go with the freedom of the direction of that you want your life. So if you want more time in your life, you can optimize your practice from that, right? Get more efficient, go down to three days a week, go down to two days a week, whatever, or pull out completely. But but it gives you the freedom of direction. To do that. If you want to optimize for money and scale, you can do that as well. If you want to optimize your practice for impact, meaning meaning the impact of of either your team or the community, awesome. If you want to optimize your profit practice for profits, only to then put a tremendous amount in, into a philanthropical purpose, with you know that is amazing too. Or if you're like Craig and you just love relationships, you love being around people, you love building an ecosystem that suits you in a relationship based practice. So it's all these tributaries of things you can do. It's not the 
not the direction that dental school told you to be. It can be whatever you want. It's like the first time I found out, uh, I think I've told you this story, Craig, we were in, in Deniform lab or whatever you call it, cutting on Deniform. And I found a- uh, Preclin. Yeah, Preclin. And I found a, uh, I found a, a diamond burr. You know, we've been cutting on plastic teeth with carbide burrs because that makes a lot of sense. I found a diamond burr. All of a sudden, I was like, what is this magic? And I put it yeah. in and I cut the, cut the tooth and it was the, the greatest plastic prep I've ever done. And I was like, why didn't, why, why are we not doing this? Like, why did you not tell me about this? I'm like, oh, you shouldn't be do- using that yet. I'm like, yeah, heaven forbid, heaven forbid you tell me something that makes things easier, better, faster. Um, maybe a, maybe a far-fetched example, but no, I like but, it. I, I like what you're saying. But freedom of direction is important. And when you become, and you don't have to maximize just for one of those domains, by the way, Pete, you can, no, you can pick it can be all three. Of yeah. Right. But like, but when you become empowered, right. And when you stop living in this vulnerable position of like, oh, I don't have any options. I have no time. I have no purpose. All these things. When you start optimizing for this, what I call the freedom of direction, it empowers you to a place that like, just makes you get, want to get out of the bed in the morning and work for you, work for you, work for that direction, work for that freedom. And so I just love it because not many businesses, Craig, not many owners can do this. Not many professions that have the respect of dentistry can do this. And so and that's also, there's I'm, another layer of, of optionality here too, Peter, in that let, let's say you do own your own practice and you can't, and you don't want to do the work to get it right. You could always have an associateship where you can maximize, you know, purpose, money, time, blah, blah, blah. So this is not just the owner's um, paradigm. This is a, a, this is the dental paradigm. And in fact, it's what led me to build my massive project and take such a leap of faith because I knew as a dentist, if I would have failed at what I did, I can pick a place anywhere in the United States, right. the best go place make, ever go make and go make money. I mean, if you're a restaurateur and you spend three or $4 million and get a whole bunch of investors and you're like most restaurants where you have like an 85 or 90% chance of going out of business in the first three to five years, Good luck doing restaurant 2.0. Good luck with that. Whereas mm-hmm. a dentist, it does not matter. I would not care. You would not care if a doctor came in and said, hey, I was in Athens, Georgia. I tried to run this practice for five years. I'm a great clinical dentist, but I completely had to shut, shut under my doors. You wouldn't care. Not one bit. Not one bit. Yeah, so just look at that for um, additionally for uh, uh, as an associate as well, not just the owner paradigm. Let me, so go so, through this if you don't mind. Yeah, so this is like talk, talking about kind of the – We've already been talking about the patient experience timeline, and you mentioned that you, you should kind of draw one that's a dentist dentist analog to that as, as things you do in, across your CE venture or learning venture. Um, but there's touch pain points throughout the patient experience. It starts before they step in the office, like I kind of already talked about. Um, they're engaging with your office at least four times prior to actually stepping in the front door. So this is where the experience starts, not just with the key person that, that is your quote unquote receptionist, that it starts before that. And just because your assistant is great with making them feel good and you are good at making them feel warm and fuzzy, it starts long before that. And I, and I would contend that it starts even when they start before they start contacting you, meaning like how easy were you to find? How easy was your website to navigate? How easy was it to find information? Are there videos on the site that are reducing the friction, meaning are they eliminating some of the fear of the unknown? What is the office going to look like? What is the doctor going to look like? What's he going to sound like? What's his, what's his tone? Do I see pictures of the assistants? Do I feel like I, I know this person before I go in? And dentistry- yeah, There's a step before that, by the way, Pete, too. Okay. The, you're talking about once they've decided you and then right. all the data points. The first step is what does your brand mean to the community? Oh, mm. that's the person that goes for the, they're there for an emergency. It's kind of a dumpy place, but the doctor's really nice or right. no high end. That's where you want to go. No, if you need something real, okay, go for a cleaning here, but don't have your front teeth drilled over there. You know? So it's like the brand awareness, who you are. Like when we talk about Chick-fil-A immediately before we go to the website, we have an idea of what it's going to be. It's going to be fast, cheap. They're going to say, yes, ma'am. They're going to say my pleasure. There's a whole set of ideas so that brand awareness and who you are, that's why it's so important as the, as the leader owner of a practice to really set out what you're trying to create. Yep. And, and most people are like, right. I'm a dentist, they do crowns, you know, what's right. the big deal? Come on, they know. The brand awareness then, you know, that they check that box. One second, Craig. Yeah, no worries. And then it goes to the, then it goes to the gathering of the information. It goes to sleep. So they check that box. And then they, and then honestly, then that, that checks the box for them. And then they move on to the second thing, which is, well, how does the 
community feel about them. They go and check yeah. the social and reviews and like again, the website. So they're making another confir confirmation based on the herd effect, right? What are other people thinking about? What are other people doing? What are other people saying about? Making sure this isn't a smoke and mirror scenario. Then it, then it goes into the appointment request, right? We talked about that, making sure it's it's frictionless to actually get an appointment. Is someone answering the phone? Is someone, are you offering online uh, abilities? Are you offering convenient locations? Are you offering convenient hours? These things. The next thing is the appointment confirmation, which is step four, right? Are you giving good experience with that? Is there text communication? Is there directions to the office? Again, eliminating some of these unknowns. Step five is the actual appointment is the dentistry. Lots of things you can do from experience standpoint there. Craig already said that my, my paraffin waxes are, are, they fall, are a waste of time. Um, but you know, noise canceling headphones, right? Being conscientious about the smells in the office, paying attention to the five senses that we have as humans and actually making sure those are amplified and augmented in a positive way when the person is actually in the facility. Um, not to mention, obviously, just being welcoming people, giving them a tour of the office, things like this. These are the things that, that contribute to. Step six, Craig talked about the post-op call. It is without fail, the easiest no-brainer thing to do. And it shocks me whenever we're in a room full of people and I say, raise your hand if you do, if you do post-op calls. And it's it's trending up, I think, but there was a time when there was one or two people answering it. And these are highly qualified practices, practices with with good experiences online. Another thing would be obviously the review request, which relates back to the step number two. And then, and then patient loyalty, the, the cycle restarts and it doesn't, this isn't just for the new patient, although that's what we get focused on. The cycle restarts and it's the, it's the, it's the entire existing patient experience as well. So that in itself is kind of gives a little bit more scope um, because I think Craig, we people think about an experience based on their physical being, right? I experienced this. I'm in the facility. I've experienced this. I got noise canceling headphones. I got, you know, I got digital impressions that didn't leave gook in my mouth. They think about it in that, but it's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. I think the big challenge here is that, um, like this slide says, uh, when you ask the dentist, what about the experience? Uh, they, they focus on the clinical aspect. hundred you know? percent. So go to the next, the, the slide you're on. So when we look at the qualification of the entire experience, the, for those that are not paying attention, I'm, I'm sorry, not seeing the visuals here. It's a pie chart with 95% and 5%, 5% being the dentistry and 95% being not the dentistry. And, um, we, we tend to make assumptions about our patients. My patients don't mind that I'm only open 10 to four every weekday. My patients don't mind that they have to, you know, not get permanent teeth in a day or, or, you know, that they have to wear uh, temporary that they, they don't mind that my patients don't mind alginates. Of course they do. They just don't know any better. The problem is, is there will be a guy like a Peter Bolden in your neighborhood that does all of that stuff and advertise to your patient and they will take your patient from you. Mm -hmm. So it, it's like either choose to see what's coming or choose to become irrelevant. And that's the problem. And that's, you know, the one thing that the DSOs in general are good at, they're, they're, they're implementing technology. There's a mm -hmm. lot of DSOs that have scanners. You know, if you look at the saturation or penetration of scanners in the general dentist market it's surprisingly low peter surprisingly mm -hmm. low like, like maybe 20 30 percent i think i've heard that but if you look at like <clears throat> the heartlands and the aspens and all that they all use them right so if you're sitting there like yeah i don't really mind my patients don't mind a pbs or vps impression around it um that's and tech you know. is an experience thing you like no make no sure. bones about it yes it, quit, it makes your dentistry easier better faster let's hypothetically but it also has benefit to the patient too so it is something to think about uh for sure talk about what we're doing here i can't play this inside the context of this uh pod uh, vehicle but the call that you guys fabricated um, oh yeah super funny <clears throat> so i yeah so the call basically goes um so we're playing I, something we're going to play yeah. you know how you know if you've ever yeah, been to I've like uh, an audience where someone does a mock call to your office we're doing a mock call and it's called what the dentist thinks the referral calls sound like to your office go ahead yeah it's pretty funny it was um hi thanks for calling jones family dental this is ashley i can help you oh hi ashley i was wanting to make an appointment with dr jones because i heard about his amazing shoulder prep design 
oh yeah, this is that's a fan favorite. But if you like his shoulder design, you love his modified chamfer. It's beautiful. Oh, I knew it was in the right place. And she's like, well, we'll actually make you wallet size uh, pictures of your post-operative x-ray so you can show your friends and family. Oh my God, you do that? That would be amazing. So it's kind of funny. It's But it's like <laughs> no one actually does that. But right. it's this idea uh, that they come to me the doctor, because so how'd you hear about it? his crowns, his, his margins are impeccable, right? And they they the question, should, we're not I making fun of that. They should be, but like that is not right. What's going to move the lever for referrals. Yeah. Unfortunately, patients don't, they have an, they are ill-equipped to understand the, the quality of dentistry. That's really unfortunate because a lot that of us would be, be a lot. given in my opinion, right? Impeccable. Yeah, but it's not. There, we all know people who are clinically inept and have very successful enterprise, successful with finger quotes, financially um, positive uh, clinics and uh, businesses, and they're not doing the right thing. You can do that in dentistry, unfortunately, because people don't understand. By the way, go back one slide. That yeah. old school 1911 finger pointing there, was that there? No. I, I love that. Oh, I hate that, bro. Okay. It's like that for those that can see it, comment below if you like the little 1920s. You know, I feel like when I see that, it's like, you know, Dr. Old Painless. School. All right. So, get, yeah. get rid of the finger point before the presentation. Yeah, um, it, just, it just throws me off a little bit. But I wish, I wish that, uh, I wish patients had a barometer for quality. Um, so this is this slide we're showing right now. If you're, if you're listening, and I highly encourage you to just go watch this on YouTube and just, um, is, is the next slide is actually one of, um, it's called a tech stack and, and we've done this exercise in our office and right, just looking at, at the patient experience in terms of the softwares that you're using in the office, um, a making sure that you don't have redundancy going on with multiple platforms, right. From, from an efficiency standpoint and economic standpoint, making sure you're not overpaying for something, but also just like, are things being covered and what software is. So in, in, in software development, you talk about, we talk about the tech stack, it happens and um and and in today's day and age a lot of our offices are run by a lot of technology or they're they're uh, augmented by a lot of technology but it's interesting to kind of lay this out where obviously your your craig this is your tech stack that erica did ours looks different because we use a little bit different things but very similar where the patient management software is obviously the the center and the brains of the practice and then like how do things communicate so in this instance you're talking about modento and you have confirmations and recalls and head health histories dental intel for analytics all these things um and this is a helpful slide for people to go through like i said not only from a patient experience making sure things are done right but also just from an um an automation and just kind of getting a holistic view of of your your enterprise and what's running it um i think it's it's helpful you want to comment on this no, I uh, know. I um, it's uh, it's important to know what does what, especially for a new hire too. Um, yeah, I think it's really cool. Um, this was a slide that uh, I generated. It's positive human act interaction is great for business. So, unfortunately, like I was saying just before, that people don't readily understand uh, the the quality that they're being rendered. Um, studies have shown, and this is specifically from a book where we talk about if Disney ran your hospital. People don't recommend their friends and family to healthcare environments based on the perception of outcome or quality, which is mind-boggling to me. Um, they they recommend based on the quality of the human interactions within the organization. So the perception of how well the hygienist and hygiene assistant or admin team and clinical team or doctor assistant get along. I mean, for those of us who have practiced dentistry like Peter and I for decades, how many times have you heard that? Like, you guys are like a well-organized symphony. Like, I love the way... You know, I'm really enjoying the way you, doctor, work with your assistant. It's so it's so nice to see the way you work because they just don't know. So they're just trying to like, is this going well? And they see Dr. Bolden and assistant working well together, and that's what they remark about. So if you have all the things we're talking about, amazing technology, amazing clinical skill, but you hate your team and your team hates you, that's going to be bad for your business. You can't let that go. And then, of course, I am passionate about this because – <clears throat> I spend a lot of time on Facebook, unlike Peter, and I see this long-winded discussion and discourse about how hygienists are the bane of our existence and how they want this and they want that, and we should go hygiene lists and yeah, rah, 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 let's do our own cleanings. And um, you know, Peter and I feel that hygiene is the uh, the MVP of the dental practice. And uh, I wish there if I could time, meet, wave a map. You said, Craig, that you cared more about what the patient thought than your team because your team, right? And that and that has shifted. Um, right, right. Yeah. Good point. Good point. 
Yeah, um, good point. Like I think one of the I, you know remember the you, customer is always right, right? The patient is yeah. always right. And I was like, no, the team is always right because they are yeah. the house I'm trying to protect. Patients will come and go. Team members yeah. will not. And so standing when the, up when the customer is right, when the customer is right, that means you're going to make a team member wrong. And I spent about a decade when a patient was upset, a bad review, I'd be all over that team member. And um, oftentimes um, I came in guns blazing only to have to look back and say like, damn, this is just an asshole patient. And uh, I had to eat a lot of kind of eat a lot of crow with that. Um, but I think that when we look at the lack of care, it starts from within and spreads outward to the patient. So when the leader of the practice does not care about his team or commoditizes his team, they will commoditize your patient. It's like that quote, like take good care of your team and let them take care of the, the business. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. And it's something that I had to struggle with a long time. Uh, and of course, what taking care of your team is not in the face of all the tech layoffs and the Twitter employees that used to go in and have avocado toast on the 50th uh, floor of their building before they got to work. And, uh, and the crying room, right? That is yeah, not crying room. Yeah. And that really shaped us. I mean, for a while when I was designing the building, I was thinking about taking cues from Tony Shea delivering happiness with Zappos and the Google crying room or whatever, the safe spaces and all that. We're moving away from that. Um, you almost you built can, one. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I almost built one actually. The crying room is my office actually. But the so crying room is cry. for you though. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I think that's important to take a, a, a clue from them. There's a major get back to work movement. So if you're just hearing about um, free lunches and avocado toast uh, uh, for, for everyone, I think that there's the train has left the station and it's coming back to you got to work now. Um, yeah, the pendulum is swung. They're yeah. swinging or is swinging. And I actually think Elon was the first move with that. I mean, 100%. I know he gets a lot. He gets a lot of flack for firing people um, at Twitter and firing all the kind of surplus elites that he had. Do you know um, how yep. many people he fired or or the percentage was? I wasn't an 80 percent. He fired 80 percent. He didn't. He didn't. Right. So, so he said 20 percent so, remaining and Twitter's still running just fine. So what happens is all the boards of all these other companies, all these other tech companies, Facebook, Google, Apple are like, well, let's do what he did. And by the way, he's getting a lot of flack from monetizing the blue check. Instagram now has just monetized it. So Twitter's mm -hmm. Twitter's blue check is eight dollars. Mm -hmm. Instagram's blue check is like double that, and he get he's just get hung out to dry. The mainstream media hates this guy, unfortunately. They really do. Um, they really but, do. And, these and that was evident, that was evidenced by the end. And we're going on a tangent here. The rocket launch, all they could focus on was that it failed, as opposed to look at America finally winning. Well, no, it didn't fail. It was meant to just he didn't. If it got off the launch pad, that would have been huge. It lasted for four minutes. No, the and, the boosters, the 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 uh, what are they called? Not Python boost. Uh, the Raptor engines. There were six of them that didn't go off. Right, I'm just the saying, like he's going to relaunch the second iteration within like a month or two, and mm -hmm. he's failing forward. He knew this was this was a success, and um, yeah, we're going on. But, but the headlines were it, it failed, it failed, it failed, and yeah. it was a massive success, not only for America but for obviously SpaceX. Um, oh, that's okay. so good. Talk about the true ROI of engagement, right? Because this is a slide. I think this is important, um, and this is this is yeah. I think this speaks to just the fact that we have a lot of um, undisengaged people, team members. They don't have any meaning they're just on this page i'm sorry uh we have a lot of employees who are disengaged who are not mm -hmm. actively engaged and um i think that lack of care like the prior slide says it starts if you really trace back to the failings of a business it all rests upon the psychology and skill set of the owner and in this case um if you don't care about them they're not going to care about you or the team uh, go back one slide if you don't mind sure so it's just you got to create meaning and not just money um transparency make it open you know people don't feel good about that giving opportunities for continued education uh positive constructive feedback and feeling valued most people most team members just need someone to believe in them it's like coaching little league um, i never had the opportunity to coach baseball but watching my son go through little league there are coaches that bring out the best in these kids and and there's other ones that just tear them apart uh both styles tend to work in their own way yeah but um, the, I can see that the, the best coaches of any sport are the ones that t contribute to the team and value the team and, and create more meaning than just the win. And, um, I think it's your responsibility. If you, if you find yourself as an owner of a business, you need to become that amazing coach and not just lament the fact that, oh, these millennials or these, 
you know, Gen Zs or whatever they are, you know, they, they need to be coddled so much like, Hey bro, you're the one or Hey girl, you're the one who wanted to start a business. You can't change society. You have to adapt to society. Don't resent it. Maybe you want to, you know, but if you want to take it seriously, you have to invest in your team. I saw something on Instagram going to quotes talking about Instagram. It was hilarious. And I think it relates here a little bit because you're talking about little league. You've probably seen it where it's like, Hey kids, if you're going home and your parents or your dad's saying, it's okay. It doesn't matter win or lose as long as you're having fun. Then your dad's probably a loser. <laughs> Have you seen that? It's viral hilarious. It's so funny. I mean, anyway. listen, it's, it's the reality. Our job as parents, um, it, and I guess now as an extension leaders in the office, we have to create rules that are consistent with society. And there is a narrative that's like before you get into the world and after you get in the world, and the narrative before you get in the world is everybody deserves a trophy. Right. Everything's great. Trophy's Equity. Trophy. It's all good. You know, you're as long as you're enjoying it. And then you turn 18 years in one day and you go to Walmart and get your first and you job and they fire you immediately. So it's it's our job to set things up in reality. And the same thing goes to the employee relationship. Mm -hmm. Hey, just because you sit in the chair for one extra year, you're not entitled to a raise. This next year, you know, here, congratulations, you're getting your raise today. But for the next raise, you have to find a way to get more valuable. What does that mean? Do you want to learn these skills? You want to go to Deborah Nash and learn phone skills? You want to learn how to design a Sarah crown? You, you have, you, it's, it's your health responsibility health to, to right? yeah. you have to figure out a way to find the raise. Mm -hmm. And it's the like, same thing. We owe it to them. If we don't explain to the team member, this is how to win, they're going to be upset with you and quit on you. So that's why I'm such a big believer in having reviews, performance reviews, and salary compensation that are on different times. So the review of what they can do mm -hmm. will happen in one year. It's very good. Um, I'm sorry, the salary discussion will happen in one year after we talk about what you should do. And most of the times people are like, you know, if you ask an employee, what do you need from me? They'll say nothing. Or maybe I need you to point me in the right direction for the CE. Or can you pay for it? But outside of that, they'll come back to you and say, I wasn't able to do it, you know, or I was able to do it. So it's it's just better to have that in their control. But this is I think a, a lot of the experience, and I'm gonna jump on to the next slide, Greg. Um, I think a lot of the experience is is it's incumbent upon you to try to attract a talent. And how do you attract a talent? Obviously, by making your organization or the benefit to the to the employee as as uh, as best as you can. And that doesn't mean just money, it means there's a lot of things that go into that, right? Um, so, you know, we had this slide created, I think you guys had one done as well. And I have this uh, on the, the Atlanta dental spa website in the career section, because it's constantly trying to attract thoroughbreds, top tier people, because we want a top tier experience. And it just got kind of shows in, in a, in a, in a colorful way, like all the things that you could expect as being a team member. You know, not a staff member, a team member, it seems like. So even just granular, like figs, you get nice scrubs and you look nice. And we go to team events, social events, and you get paid holidays and 401, medical insurance, all these things, right? And I feel like once the, the, the individual is taken care of or feels like they're taken care of, it's so much easier for them to bestow that care, like you were talking about, Craig, so much easier for them to bestow that care to the patient, to the, the experience, to the patient. And we even talked about this when we were creating the slide, right? Right, Quarterly, I give someone an envelope that, that shows them their net, net benefit of being in the organization from a dollar standpoint. And this started in, in COVID because it seemed like our uh, right after COVID, rather, when, when people were kind of um, leaving jobs in a rapid amount in dentistry, right? I can get paid 50 cents more down the street. And they were comparing and contrasting the, the, the hourly rate in which they were getting paid versus the hourly rate of their friend. And so I was compelled to kind of create something that was like, yeah, that's just the start. Do not, do not put that in your brain. Do not let that be scorched into your brain. Is that the net benefit to you? So yeah, one, people it's just don't understand financial financial. Yeah, and so it's just finances. it's just like, hey, here's the net effect to you. And at the end of the day, that's all we should care about. Not the hourly. It's good. You got this bonus. You got this four one. The net benefit to you. And I feel like once people can put that aside and know that they are being compensated and taken care of as best as they can, they can then, like I said, they can then really optimize that experience. But someone who's got apathy or little grumpy pants is not giving the patients a great experience. And even Agreed. with all the stuff that you do, when you say, hey, your your real net salary is not $20 an hour, when you look at everything, it's 24. 
there's still going to be a good percentage of society because financial illiteracy is so common, common rather, that will just say, hey, I get it, but I'm going to go over there because they're going to pay me 21. You're like, you're making 25. Well, no, I'm making 20. No, but you know, and they just don't get right. it. Well, I can't depend on that. Right. I can't depend yeah. on that bonus. Yeah. Um, but that's what you got last year. So it's, so we yeah. talk about, we talk about a lot in the in I mean you all know this who are listening but we talk about KPIs and we've kind of we've kind of distilled down what we think are the five KPIs that move the needle and this is where the presentation goes out of kind of the patient experience and it's like how to kind of make your practice a little bit more bulletproof. I love analytics software. I love things that tell you data. I think the things that attracted you to that platform, right? When you're seeing the UI UX, the interface at the dental convention, you're thinking, wow, that's awesome. Look at all this data. In reality, in sustainability, you don't have time to look at that. So in, in the absence of, of it's either all or nothing, Craig and I have kind of distilled down it, and Dwight has helped a lot with this, kind of distilling down five things that you really want to look at. If you can't look at anything or you're not going to look at it, the, the hundred that you proclaim that you would, Start with these, start with one or two. And these are the five that we feel are the big, big levers that we alluded to earlier. And they are the practice pre-appointment pre rate, right? Which Greater is the public. number one lever right. of all of them. If you had to focus on one, is that one. The active patients with the within next visit um, is greater than 73%. Um, a production per visit, are you tracking how efficient your visits are, right? Um, and that is that that is the the appv the average production per patient visit and 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 um who's the dental intel guy white wins uh uh oh you're Rob. thinking oh uh, you're back in the day you're talking back in the about day, and he was like look it should you know ideally west, like, west, west. Yes. i was like it should be greater than six hundred dollars is it weston or, west yeah weston yeah um number three is the utilization rate and this is really dwight's baby and this is how he analyzes things from a from from any from the efficiency of the facility Right. And he also uses this as a, when he's looking at acquisitions from an underperforming or overperforming practice. And so you want to look at the net office production of uh, the utilization of each operatory per hour you're open. And this, these sound like complicated math and it's not. Um, obviously, net growth, we've been banging on that drum for years now, right? Forgetting about just new patients is the only metric. It's actually new patients versus the ones that's become inactive. And when you want to get really good, you focus on increasing the inactives and decreasing the ones that become inactive, right? Close that back door, open that front door. And you want that net growth to be about 20, 22% year over year. And then another one, the last one is, is treatment acceptance percentage. Obviously you want your treatment percentage of the things that you are proposing to the patient. You want about 60% of those being accepted, um, which is roughly a third of what it is. And, and there's some science and psychology there. But obviously, you don't want it being 100 because that means you you would probably only only uh, treatment planning occlusal composites if you're always 100, and you don't want it being too low, right? So 100% probably means you're underdiagnosing. 20% means you're probably overdiagnosing. So the Goldilocks scenario we found is about 60%. Anything yeah, you want to add there? Uh, no, no. Of all those, um, that number that that one is the single metric that's associated to yeah. If you're only going to look at one, success. right? Yeah, if you're only yeah. going to look at one, you want to look at the pre the practice pre appointment. Yeah, um, that's correlated with overall success, which is wild to me. This is a slide. This is going to promote the summit, and obviously, maybe um, we've got a cool kind of little intro video that's talking about the energy that's going to be in the room. Uh, Vegas is going to prove to be the best one yet, um, but usually things in Vegas always are. And I was just having a conversation, Craig, with um, with Paul. I was in Philadelphia this weekend at Paul's conference. Right, these level up. Uh, Paul from Dental Nachos, Paul Goodman. And he was saying how he's bringing his family and it was like, oh yeah. And I was like, you know what? Vegas is whatever you want it to be, right? If you yeah, want to go and party with the boys or party with the girls and do some degenerate stuff, like that's your place. But if you, if you want to take your family and like have a cool family vacation and go to cool shows and do things like that's your yeah, place. It's your foodie. It's your place. Yeah. It's your foodie. It's yeah. I mean, so it's anything you want it to be. And I think that's why it's so popular, but obviously at an iconic hotel, like the Wynn, it's going to be amazing. This giant ass ballroom we're going to have amazing people, amazing energy, amazing sponsors, uh, amazing room discounts, you know, on the order of about $600. The discount is going to be on the order of about $600 versus Crazy. what you can buy at rack rate on Expedia, know. you know, $900, $800. And we're, and we're in the $200 range. Those yeah, are going if you're thinking up. about doing an entertaining trip, you know, sorry, Peter, but if you're, you know, I, I keep eating on this drum. Everybody wants an entertaining trip. Th this is going to be entertaining, but educational. So um, I'm all for a booze cruise. I think it's really cool. 
But um, why not do both? I think learning can be fun too. And that's what we promised to do at the Bulletproof Practice uh, Summit. We And we also have that 10 times guarantee. You I've even told people in the past, like, spend 100 grand. I don't care. It's worth every penny. You know what's interesting, Craig? I actually had someone that I saw at, at Paul's conference came up. He's like, yeah, I went to the Bulletproof. It was awesome. You know, I got, I, I kind of like did that. And I was like, thinking, I was like, are you coming this year? He's like, no, I got the information. And I was like, <laughs> Ud, you don't understand. We work on updating stuff all year long. I mean, meaning like marketing of 2023 is categorically different than it was when you went in 2019. He's like, really? I'm like, yes, yes. Yeah. This new, this, this isn't like a, this isn't like just uh, evergreen information that we're getting. This is dynamic information. Dynamic. Yeah, I know the thing I did for Seattle Study Club, I recorded it like three weeks ago. It's not being aired till September. The way things change and the way things that you and I are always changing, I think that's outdated. You know, that's like felt like, is that going to be still green enough? Yeah, it's always new. You know, we're refining our practices. But let's face it, Peter, you and I were in different TED spaces in 19. You know, we we were we were not our businesses were not refined to the point that they are now. COVID helped shape a lot of what we talk about now and a lot a lot of ways in which we treat things. So if your last bulletproof summit was even if it was just last year, um, absolutely go to this one because also all new breakout content as well. I know the hygiene girls and Erica's got all new stuff as well. Our stuff is all new. So now I am, um, I, I highly encourage it. Or if you came and you have new team members, bring them as well. Um, it breaks my heart when I see a dentist going solo and at the end, they're like, man, I should have brought my team here. Cause uh -huh. I just know that that information is going to likely die in the vine. You can't come back on Monday and be like, yeah, the hygienists were talking about this. You know, why don't you do that? Like you're never going to implement that crap. The only way to implement this is to go together. Yep, it's exciting. Um, so well, the good. good news, Peter, we're going to have a lot of extra time for our presentation because we have a full hour and we just got through that pretty damn quick. Well, but there were some things we didn't expand on because we have a known audience here, right? Like, I think we skipped over some things because we, people know us that are listening yeah. to the pod. So it's exciting. I'll be wearing um, a bulletproof suit. Um, cool. I'll be wearing a Bitcoin maximalist uh, suit. Oh, you should. You no, should. I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, I Are you a Bitcoin maxi again? You know what? I'm not. I'm not. But I, I have a very, very close friend, one of my best friends, who's like diehard Bitcoin. So I just want to support him all the time. That's awesome. That's that sounds yeah. like he, that guy sounds like a really cool guy. He's a really um, cool. You should yeah, get to know yeah. him one day. How did you get a friend like that? That's pretty cool. Um, he reached out to me on Instagram. Oh, you like were... five, six years, eight years. Ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, also, Peter, I, I really appreciate you coming out to my ranch. Peter came down for a 24 hour trip mm -hmm. and came out to my ranch property and we rode dirt bikes around and um, it was really fun. It was really special to have you here. So thank you for that. It was awesome. It was very impressive. It, it, your operation. I said, you've come a long way from, from, uh, from the Miami the guy only up in his Porsche. He, Craig was walking around with side by sides and a gun on his hip and shooting stuff and looking for snakes and feeding chickens. And I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> but it's, but, but I like Craig 2.0 way better than, than 1.0. Listen, if you're not, I, I, I was listening to Patrick Pet David the other day and you always, the, the greatest compliment you can pay somebody is to say when you don't recognize somebody, when you haven't mm. seen someone in like three or five years, like you're different. You just feel different because life is always changing. And if you don't adapt and evolve, you're, you're, you're not really playing life to its fullest. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, don't feel inauthentic when you evolve. Because a lot of people don't want you to change. I'm like, well, what do you? You can't do that. You can't. You can't do that. That's not who you are. Eh, Have you ever you made you excuses for your evolution? And where, can I? Yeah, I can because people, that. our evolution makes people feel uncomfortable. Right. Right. You don't practice dentistry more, Bolden. Oh well, it's well. What, what yeah, we used to there's dental shame. School. There was shame for so long with that, as opposed to being like, no, 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 no. Wait a second. Wait a second. You know. Um, well, it's whatever works for you, man. You just have to yeah. keep evolving. The greatest compliment you can have is when someone says like, wow, you're so different. Even uh, if it brings up something for them, you know, yeah. I, I think that's important. I wasn't thinking about like the ranch thing, but you know, it's, you gotta, you gotta constantly be reinventing yourself. And I love it. that's uh, another plug for the summit. If you're kind of lost, you know, in the next couple moves, that's a good time to go. Take well, and, and too physically, them. right? So many of us go to shit. Can I just do this on a zoom thing and like not have to travel? But I think there is so much power, like, and every time I go to something dental, even if it's ours or not, 
putting yourself in a unique location, right, amongst other batteries. And I use that battery analogy because when you get in a room of like-minded individuals, you're tapping into that energy. You're almost connecting it in series like my golf cart is, right? It's a bunch of 12-volt batteries that add up to be 48, and the engine runs on 48 volts, right? Because they're connected in series. And I really feel like when you're sitting down and you're collaborating with people and you're hearing someone else's struggle that you have not met, um, you know, that's the power of a mastermind. That's the power of conferences. And and this is not a sales pitch, so to speak. This is not us trying to encourage you to come to, to, the, to the summit. The summit will be fine. Right? Whether you are like, oh, I, this is where they're, they're selling me on it. It really isn't. If you don't know by now, our place is coming from authenticity. We truly just want to help dentistry. We'll stop. Yeah, I wish there was a way to wet, wave that magic wand that I keep talking about. Just get more dentists to go to this because our profession's beautiful. You and I love it. And we're doing so shitty on a macro. We're doing so shitty. And then the, the selling narrative kind of coming full circle mm. is the natural Lipitor or you know, pharma, ph big pharma drug, the one pill that everybody's just swallowing. And they don't have to do that. And you that. have they said this actually... well, Craig. People don't sell. Like you love, people don't sell things they love. Yeah, right. They don't. You said that, right? Your favorite car. You're not selling that because you love it. Your favorite, what, right? So fall in love with and your by practice, the way, fall you... in love with your operations and you won't want to sell. And, and by the way, in the eventuality of you do selling it, a practice that runs without you and a practice that you enjoy is actually more valuable anyway. Um, so <laughs> that's fix the it book now. to sell model. That book don't, I say is the Yeah, don't fix change. it. Don't fix It's like, you know, it's like having a shitty house and getting ready to go to market and putting new appliances and painting it. You're like, oh, wait, I should have done this a while ago. I could have yeah. lived in this. Could have lived in your money. Yeah. Like, uh, like Randy says, right? Yeah. That's true. Anyway, buddy, I'm excited to see you again. I know I just saw you last week. That was it was good to uh good to connect, good to be in nature, good to yeah. uh, and I'll see you uh see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow afternoon. Okay. Thanks for listening, guys. If right, you right, liked for it, going drop through this list and yeah, yeah, give us some feedback. And if there's something, I was actually thinking about this. This last thing I will say. <clears throat> if um if there's something that we haven't covered in a while, something you want to hear, something you're yearning to get information that is not being covered on any of the other pods that you feel like we are uniquely equipped to do so let us know if we and maybe we can get to that so leave comments we read these comments as a matter of fact we read them and then lacy forwards them to us when we get comments on youtube so it is a we we see all the things whether it's on bulletproof dental i mean uh, with my, our money networks whether it's on our bulletproof network uh whether it's on youtube whether it's email we get all the things because it's our oxygen, right? Knowing that if we're doing something, are we making impact and contributions towards people's lives in dentistry? Agreed. Well, thanks, buddy. Agreed. Thanks for the time. Yeah. And uh, yeah. looking forward to seeing you tomorrow and looking forward to seeing everybody at the AACD. If you're, um, hopefully we'll meet in a lot of new friends. By the time this comes out, we'll already be back, but should be fun. Thanks, buddy.